You're listening to Inside Real Estate, your source for all things mortgage and real estate related. The show that brings you all the hottest topics and insight directly from those who know it most. Now sit back and enjoy the show. So, so excited for this episode. Sal, you know why I'm excited. I do. Yeah, so we've got, uh, so by the way, guys, it's Paul Paslakis, Salvatore Cusmano. Uh, Brad Weisgerber is not here. He's still vacationing, longest vacation ever. And we are inside real estate. Um, obviously, find us at IREpodcast.com. So, yeah, super excited. Barry's, I don't want to put Barry, he's actually on the line as we speak, but I did, Barry, I, I do want you to know one thing about Sal this weekend. Sal went to LA and had the pleasure of meeting the kid from the Stranger Things show. What was it? What's his name? The, like the, the nerdy kid? Yeah, Dustin. Do you know who we're talking about? Do you watch Stranger Things? I don't. You don't. Fine. No. That, that, then that means nothing to you. <laughs> uh, Barry, Barry, obviously, everyone, just so everybody knows, Barry is the CEO and founder of MBS, MBS Highway. He is a champion in, in the industry as far as uh, really economics. Uh, he gives such good, good feedback. Um, MBS Highway is a great platform. He also uh, is a big investor in the Rock of Ages, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But Barry, how are you? I'm good. I'm actually managing partner in, in Rock of Ages, but that's okay. Also, also, you know, part owner. But yes. Oh, I'm, so I'm my apologies. Now. My apologies. No I just thought so. There you go. But no, you're you're really involved in that, and it just launched again, correct? We did just launched in New York. Yes, yes. So uh, managed that that property uh, all over the world. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited about our New York launch. It's going great. We've got such fun things going on. I just put a deal together with the Yankees for the 31st. So we're gonna have Yankee night. We're going to put a couple of them in the cast. The last time I did it, we had Mark Teixeira in it, and they went and won the World Series. So maybe they'll copy that and do it again. And then August 7th, I've got the Mets. I've got Tony Robbins night. It's, it, we're, we're doing a lot of things. Be careful, Barry. You're going to have every ball player at calling you now, asking to be on your show. On the show. <laughs> you, know, you know, but they we, we do still get calls because when a lot of players come into town. You know, it's the cool show to go to. So it's a great show for them to go to or to send people that are with them, maybe their significant others. And you know, it's, it's a great night. It's a good time. It's, it's one of those shows where it's not just like, you know, a lot of times ladies like going to Broadway shows and the guys get dragged along here. It's yeah. like guys yeah. love the show just as much as the ladies do. That's a, that's a good calling card right there. You will enjoy it too if you're a dude. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, well, con- yeah. congratulations on all that success. I mean, that's really, I mean, it's so divergent from, from, you know, it's funny because you have this, you, you're, you're in the mortgage world, you're in the real estate world, you're in the economics of, e- economic world, and then you've got this totally different thing that's, that's got to be a nice break from, from your normal every day. It is. I do a lot of fun things. You know, I did have a medical imaging business, which I built and sold and, and had that, which was very diverse. And uh, I still sing in a band, which I've done for many years. So that's kind of a different, you know, it's just, it, it's nice to not be, uh, be in, in one area. Just, but, but you know what's so crazy about it, guys, is there's so many similarities. You know, if you could alleviate points of friction, uh, you could find a lot of ways to be successful by alleviating points of friction, regardless of, of the industry that you're in. Can you explain the points of friction thing? Because that's interesting. So, for example, you know, in the mortgage business, you know, I had done business as an advisor and uh, came up with that people should really be doing it that way and, and uh, was able to create MBS Highway. Which, I'm sorry, before that, Mortgage Market Guide, which helped people not to get surprised by intraday reprices, and that became ubiquitous. And then when I was in uh, the medical imaging business, I had realized that people – it would go for scans, and I hope that no one listening has to go for a scan for any bad reason, but heaven forbid if you did or if you do, then you know that the tech is looking at this, and they know what's going on, but they can't communicate it to you. And your anxiety plays on your nervous system, and you know, unless you have your physician's number in your cell phone, which most of us don't, you're in a position where you now have to wait several days to hear back, and you start looking on WebMD. You say, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to die." Yeah, I'm making yeah, that's like crazy. the worst thing you can you know, do. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so exactly. You know what I mean? So I said, "Why? Why put people through that anxiety?" So I had a radiologist there, alleviated a point of friction. The business took off. We had three centers, and then sold the company. Wow. At Rock of Ages, no show on Broadway allowed drinking alcohol on the seats. 
and I would watch like the show would begin and you know the, the lights would flicker and you get the ding, ding, you get the chimes you got to get in your seat within two minutes and people who would get there they'd have to wait online they get their drink they pay 18 bucks for the drink and I'd see these people nicely dressed guzzling drink <laughs> you know, just, uh, why do you have to make people do oh, that that's so, so true it's said, so true so why don't you just allow drinking in the seats? And they say, well, we've never done that. I, I, my response was two. Was one is exactly, and also that's not a very good answer for me that we've never done that before. Um, so I had to kind of really have fight an uphill battle, but got it done. It was the first show in the history of Broadway to allow drinking in the seats, and now they all do it. So um, things like that are just examples of alleviating points of friction which are so important. If we could find those points of friction, alleviate those points of friction, you could have huge success and make a big impact and change. There's a lot of value to that. That's awesome. That, that, that's Tremendous. really interesting to think of the world that way because there are a lot of points of friction to your point. It, and just if you, if you think of like Amazon, right? They fixed a problem. They, they can ship th- things to you, right? So that's interesting. Uh, Don't complain about it. Fix it. Right, right, exactly. If, if you're complaining about it, there's a point of friction. Let's figure it out. That's right. That's really that's good. That's right. Um, Awesome. So obviously, Barry, like in our in our space, right? We're, we we own a mortgage company. We're in real estate. So for for me, it's it's you know we had you on the show last time, and we were like in a rising rate environment, and it was interesting because, you know, even me, I, I don't think many people in the in the business were even saying where everybody was saying they're going up, they're going up, and even though you said they were, they potentially could go up, you said there's still a lot of room for them to go down, which was interesting to me then. And what happened since then is really interesting because today's interest rate environment is way, way, way different than what we were, where we thought it would be. Personally, like even like collectively, a lot of people were thinking the same thing. So- well, a few things to that. So a, a few years back, I had made a pretty good call on the market. So the ten-year Treasury is going to some crazy number. I, 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 I had talked about it was one point three nine. That's what the the charts had told me. And, on CNBC, they thought I was nuts, and on every show I'd go on, I say, "Are you crazy?" Because the ten-year Treasury was like a two point eight percent, and nobody had saw that coming. And you know, it didn't go to one point three nine; it went to one point three seven. So, you know, kind of nailed that one. And not too long ago, I made another crazy call and saying that rates will go to their lowest levels ever. And you probably, I know you've seen it; it's all been yeah. all over social yeah, media yeah. and this and that. Um, and, and that's when the ten-year Treasury was at two and two and two forty-nine. Okay, so call almost two and a half percent. So, it was. Very controversial. Now, yields have come down a lot since then, but I think they do have, as you said earlier, a lot more room to go. And if you look historically, every peak and trough that you've had since 1982, the peaks have been lower than the previous every single time. The troughs have been lower than the previous every single time, including the peak that we had seen back in in the fall of, of 2018. So I do think that the next trough will be lower than the 1.37. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. So number one, if you compare us globally, the United States, while yields are low, they're much higher than everywhere else in the world. So we have a lot of room to drop. The Fed's got a lot of room to, to cut, and they're going to have to cut. Uh, we're st- seeing signs of slowdown in many different parts of our economy. I know that you know we're, we're always getting you know the feedback that, oh, you know, the economy is strong, but there are a lot of areas in the economy that are starting to roll over. And I think over the next... 30 to 45 days, you'll find out earnings-wise that perhaps there are some concerns on the earnings front as we now are in uh, second quarter of earnings season uh, those, uh, that those reports come in. Now, when, when we take a look at things that are more widely publicized, like the inversions in the yield curve, so what does that mean? That just is a fancy way of saying that longer-term maturities are less than shorter-term maturities. And we've been that way for a while. The three-month Treasury is yielding more than the 10-year treasury is. And that's crazy, right? It's like if you went to the bank and you said, okay, what are your CD options? They say, okay, we got a three-month CD that yields this, but the 10-year, you commit for 10 years, you'll get even less in interest. Well, why is that? And, and I think it, it, it tells us a lot. It gives us an important message in that it helps us to understand that first let me explain it to you, and then I'll tell you what the meaning is. Got it. Yeah, do so, it. The longer-term maturities, like the 10-year, they're more concerned with inflation. And the reason for that is because let's just say if you guys lent your own money. And let's say you did it as a mortgage. You just lent out money and and you you let people borrow money for you to buy a home. And it's your own money, so they pay you every month. Let's just say it's simple. They give you 1000 bucks a month. And you take that $1,000, and every month you go buy a basket of goods and services and you notice that something starts to change 
over time. You know, the first few months, you know, maybe the first six months, you could buy all the same stuff. But then you say, hmm, my money's not going as far. Why? Because prices rise a little bit. That's inflation. And inflation literally erodes the buying power that you get on that fixed payment that you're receiving. It doesn't go as far. Yeah. So you've done that deal. And let's say you and Sal are lending out money, and you, and you guys are, are, are good with that. But now the next uh, one that comes out, the next loan that you're going to do, rather, Inflation news comes out showing that inflation is on the rise or well, has risen. I want more money now. You already you already figured it out. Exactly. Yeah, it did yeah. not take you long because no. you guys are very smart. But let's explain that a little bit. Why? Because that higher rate of inflation will now more rapidly erode that fixed payment that you're getting. So your money will not go as far in a more rapid pace and in order to protect yourself, you can't control inflation. The only thing you could do is start from a higher perch to protect yourself from more rapid erosion. So maybe not a, a thousand bucks a month, maybe you need eleven hundred bucks a month, which means that you'd have to charge a higher interest rate. And in a nutshell, guys, that's why interest rates go up and down. If there's more inflation, then interest rates have to go up. If there's less inflation, like you have today, then interest rates can come down. But here's the important aspect of it. What causes inflation? So inflation is the definition of that, guys, is too much money, too many dollars chasing too few products. In other words, Apple is going to release a new phone. And people are sleeping overnight at the Apple stores, right? And they, you know, there's a big line. Well, clearly, Apple is not going to put that product on sale. They're going to sell it for full price. And they're going to make a lot of money. But let's just say there's an item that's not selling. What does the vendor do? The vendor tends to put it on sale and prices drop. So prices rising, inflationary. Dropping, deflationary. What causes prices to rise? Well, I have the ability to raise prices because there's high demand. High demand, stronger economy. Prices are dropping. Why? I don't have any pricing pressure. I'm trying to sell. Nobody's buying. That's a sign of a weaker economy. So when the 10-year is coming down because inflation is low, there is signs that the economy is weaker. Now, the shorter end of the curve, the three-month, the one-year, the two-year, this part of the yield curve is far more concerned with what the Fed's doing because the Fed is a one-day, or as they say, a one-night overnight, overnight lending rate. Yeah, yeah. So that is a very short <laughs> maturity. So now the three-month is going to compete with that. The three-month doesn't care about inflation because that – that debt is over in three months. That's matured in three months. So inflation, whether inflation is up a half a percent or down a half a percent, it's not going to matter. If it's for 30 years, it has a big difference. For three months, who cares? You're not going to feel it, right? Mm -hmm. For a year, you're not going to feel it, yeah. which is why those interest rates are more concerned with what's the Fed doing. And when those yields are higher on the short end than the longer end, what it's telling you is this. Here's the message. It's saying there's weakness in the economy. That's what the longer end is telling us. But the shorter end is saying the Fed's too darn high, and the so Fed like is leading, not responding to the weakness in the economy. Is it Barry? Is is it safe to say it's like a leading indicator when this starts happening? Very much so. In fact, you're 100 percent right because when you get these inversions, with 100 percent correlation, they always lead to a recession. Now we always have a recession. So for saying there's going to be a recession, that's you know, people are scared deal. of that. Though, Barry, Barry, freak out. They freak out because they remember 2008. I don't think it's like recession isn't that every time we're gonna we're gonna break that down we're gonna break that down so mm -hmm. let me tell i'm gonna give you guys a very big payoff as to what to do personally mm -hmm. and how to advise your customers but first let's understand it a little bit better sure. so we have an inverted yield curve it's remained inverted between the three month and the 10 year for quite some time so we could say safely that there's going to be a recession the timing of it looks to me like 2020 now you might have recalled back in 2017 i said you know 2020 looks like a great target for recession because that would have matched and been the longest period of time we've ever had as an expansion in our country, which we've just eclipsed right now. And I said that if you take a look at, the, at, at another indicator, even more accurate than the inversion of the yield curve, it's telling us 2020. And what is that? And that's the rate of unemployment. So in our history, every time the unemployment rates dip below 4.7%, three years later, you get a recession. We dipped below 4.7% in 2017. That's when I started to say 2020 looks like a recession to me. Now, the unemployment rate is a great indicator. Let's go back 100 years, go through all the recessions. If I were to say, hey, when would you get a recession, Paul? Would you get a recession when the unemployment rate's low or when it's high? Now, you're a really sharp guy. You and Sal know your stuff, so you might know this, but most of us would guess that that ah, recession will probably happen when the unemployment rate is high, and that's the exact opposite. And here's the deal. 
Recessions occur within six months of when the unemployment rate has reached its lowest level and starts ticking higher in a meaningful way. So we had the unemployment rate tick to 3.6%. Last time it was 37 I wouldn't panic over that. But if it gets above 4%, that would tell me that we're going to probably see a recession within six months of that. And there's a lot of things that you need to do personally to protect yourself, which I'll explain why. But again, first, let's get the details. So why is this happening? Why? Well, let's think about it. If business is good, what are you doing? You're hiring people because, hey, man, I I need more people. I can't can't, produce as much as they want. Everybody's Mm -hmm. doing great. So I keep hiring people. And what does that do to the unemployment rate? Keeps dragging it down, lower, 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 lower. Now, something starts to change in business and things aren't as good and I'm um, stopped hiring. And in fact, I noticed that I've got a few people that are sitting around that I don't have work for them to do. So what do I have to do? The unfortunate task of letting people go. And as I do, those people now join the unemployment ranks and it ticks the rate of unemployment rate a little bit higher. It brings the unemployment rate a little bit higher. But now let's think about the mindset of those poor folks who were just let go. Are they going out to fancy dinners? Are they going doing clothes shopping, furniture shopping, buying homes and cars and things like that? The answer is no. So the businesses that sell cars and furniture and dinners and clothes and vacations, they start to feel the pinch as well. And so what do they have to do? They have to let go of people, and the cycle perpetuates itself. And it changes, Paul, so amazingly fast how the unemployment rate goes way up during a short period of time. So... This is why recessions tend to follow the unemployment rate to start to tick higher. It's just a sea change that occurs, and we have to be careful of that. So now, knowing this, we also understand that during recessions, something pretty important occurs personally, and that is the stock market does not do well. And stocks during recessions tend to drop between 35 and 50 percent for the duration of the recession, which could be six months to a year. And if you think about it, that's an enormous loss of wealth. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the dot-com bubble, when stocks dropped like that, people who were planning to retire no longer could. And during the financial crisis, during that recession, same thing happened. So people had to work much longer. And the damage that's done takes a long, long, long time to recover if you have the stomach for it, what happens is a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, I'm giving up. I can't take it anymore. And they sell their stock positions at the worst possible time, and then they don't get the benefit of the recovery. So what I'm saying to you is this. If you're listening and you see that unemployment rate tick to 4%, 4.1%, I want you to be careful. I just want you to be maybe a little bit more careful or cautious or defensive in your equity positions. Don't take a 50% haircut on them. Talk to people that you trust or just start to be a little smarter, a little bit more defensive personally. Now, where can we make money? Well, there's a few different areas. What we know is during recessions, interest rates drop dramatically during recessions. Remember, inflation becomes lower. The right. central banks are lowering rates. So, so now, what does well? Well, treasuries do really well. And, I mean, personally, I have a lot of money of mine in treasuries. I've been catching this ride down and making some really good returns. Now, currently, the stock market is also doing well, but I think when this change occurs, treasuries will continue to do well and stocks will probably have a tough time. Now, another way to make money is gold, because if the Mm -hmm. central bank keeps cutting rates, then gold tends to go up. And if you think about it, look at anticipation of this. Gold's already kind of started to make a move higher, but I think it's got a long way to go. Silver's a good investment. So these are good places to be if you want to be defensive and protect yourself, at least with a portion. But now, knowing that interest rates drop, there's a few things there. Obviously, if you're in the mortgage business, it's a great place to be. And you should also consider this. Consider that as your strategy, right? I mean, so, so what's my strategy going to be when I'm talking to a client, if I'm in the mortgage business? I know that 2020, maybe 2021, might be a good time for interest rates to have declined to a level where it would be very advantageous to refinance. So on that loan I'm doing for you today, I'm also thinking about the next loan. So that's the way I always did my loans when I was in the mortgage business. I always did today's loan, but in conjunction with the next one. I always did loans two at a time, never one at a time, because there are events that are life events that you should contemplate. Are you going to be having kids? Are the kids going to be moving out? Are you going to be an empty nester? Is your income going up, income going down? You know, what, what are you thinking about that might change in your life so we could 
work these loans in conjunction with your life events. But there's also economic events where your expertise can help. And now we have a clear signal that there's going to likely be a very good probability to refinance whatever loan we're taking out today within the next year or two. So what does that tell me? I'm not going to do upfront MI. That's stupid, right, because it takes four to five years to break even. So pay a little bit more on the monthly payment because that's a much smarter decision. I'm not going to pay points because I'll never recover them. Now, it depends on what the buy-down rates are, and sometimes they could be aggressive here. So you just have to do the math. If it takes longer than two years to recover it, don't pay the points. Another one is fees. If you could take a bit of a higher rate and incorporate some fees, and again, Work out the time schedule to where the break-even is, depending on the buy-up or buy-down costs. And you can now determine and give your clients much better advice as to keeping this transaction the most cost-saving, economical way to do it and taking advantage of the economic events. Now, there is, Paul, another thing that, that I'm sure you and Sal think about is how does this affect real estate? And if we're talking about a recession, what happens during yeah. recessionary periods? That's a great question, yeah. It's, it's very interesting because if you, you know, if you were to talk again, most people, common sense, they say, well, recession, probably real estate is going to be bad, right? Well, the history says very differently. History says that real estate has done very, very well. Why? Well, you already know the answer. It's because interest rates drop precipitously. So I want you to think about this. A recession is bad because there's more people unemployed. So the unemployment rate goes from, let's round it off and say it goes from 4% to 8%. So you've got four more percent of the people that are now unemployed. That's bad. They sure aren't going to be buying homes. How do we overcome that? Well, when interest rates drop dramatically, you now have this ability, this sheer numbers of people who now can qualify or afford to purchase a home. And when they have this ability, it overwhelms the amount of people who can't or don't want to purchase because they're now unfortunately become unemployed. This is why homes do very, very well during recessionary periods. In fact, they become a tremendous opportunity. A look at the past six recessions, five of them, home values went up during the recession and up a lot more afterwards. Now, the last recession was a little bit different, and here's where people get confused. Right. You had the housing bubble, which you know, it took place end of 2006, early 2007 was kind of like where it really manifested. So you give a little leeway there, and that's kind of where it is. But when you take a look at that and you say, okay, when did the recession occur in 2009? Well, it wasn't the recession that caused the problems in housing. It was the problems in housing that caused the recession. Right, right. Now, let's remember the last housing bubble. What were loans like there? It was like, can you fog up a mirror and we'll get you approved? If you barely didn't, have a pulse, it didn't even we'll matter. Get, get. Yeah, it was so easy. It didn't even matter. Yeah, it didn't even matter. Yeah. No yeah, credit, so no problem. Bingo. 580 FICO, no income, no asset, no job, and no down payment either. That doesn't matter to to us either. So All day. if you yeah. And the problem is is that even though most times recessions cause rates to drop enough for housing to do well, in this particular case that was just too much of a tide of problematic loans and inventory that flooded the market, that housing tried to actually go up. It actually did start to go up during the recession, but then it faltered a bit more until finding its footing and bottoming out. And then what we saw is home prices rise, as you know, pretty pretty much in, in a very um, stable way and, 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 uh, and steady for the past seven years. And if you were the unluckiest person and bought your home the day before the recession started, and here you are 10 years later, 10 years happens to be, according to the National Association of Realtors, the average time that somebody spends in a home, living in a home. Well, then you're thrilled because even though you bought right before the recession, you, you are really happy yeah. today because you, do, you made a ton of money yeah. mm -hmm. because prices have come back dramatically since then. So we are, I think, embarking in a good time here as long as we tread carefully uh, have you guys ever heard uh, you were saw here the the benner cycles no uh, i can't say that happened okay so in 1875 there was a guy by the name of samuel benner and samuel benner said hey listen you know we are very cyclical beings and he kind of went back and he did his research and he found that there are cycles for human beings where they have just events that we do things in a cyclical manner, and it's very, very dependable and reliable. 
I mean, look, if you think about it, too, I mean, there's so much documentation on, on the lunar cycle. Think about how powerful the lunar cycle is. If you know anyone in law enforcement, ask them, does the lunar cycle have an impact? Yeah, just say on a full moon. Yeah, yeah. Is it crazier? I mean, so Emergency everyone will tell rooms, you. Emergency rooms, room, nurses, they all say the same thing. Bingo. And the other thing is, is you know what's crazy? It even affects the financial markets. Do you know, statistically proven, you could verify this. Come on. What are you if you bought me? stocks on a new moon, and sold them on a full moon, your return would be 450 percent, four and a half times better than if you just bought and sold at any time. <laughs> Come on, it's wild. 450 yeah, percent better. Crazy. Okay, so yes, it is crazy. I mean, talk about cycles, guys. Is there any any more powerful cycle than the menstrual cycle? Okay, so I mean, we are <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, I am a, very aware <laughs> of that one. <clears throat> we are we are in a cyclical environment. So what did Samuel Benner say? He looked at all these cycles, and in 1875, based upon the cycles, he said there's going to be a stock market crash. When? In 1929, and there was. He also looked out and said 1987, yes, there was. He also said 2001, yes, there was. He said 2010. He's like the Nostradamus yeah, of economics. There was. <laughs> yeah. He is the Nostradamus, but he's also picked the bottoms. The Benner cycles have been very accurate now, forecasted in 2019, that we would have hit a peak. But, you know, a little bit, you know, the guy did in 1875. Let's right? give him a little bit of leeway <laughs> if it's 2020 right. or 2021, whatever. But the thing of it is, is too, that what he did not anticipate is you have more financial engineering now. There was no such thing as mm -hmm. QE or these things that are right. now causing maybe there to be. I think what you're doing here is you're just kicking a can down the road and delaying the pain, delaying the outcome. Mm -hmm. But, right. um, but I think that we will get this recession. We'll get it out of the way if we tread carefully, if we are anticipating what's going to happen. We'll get through it just fine. You can actually make money during it. Housing will do well. And, you know, what, what's crazy is this, guys, is that people say, okay, well, the Fed, they're looking at inflation. There's no inflation. There is inflation. They're just not looking at it the right places. There's inflation in housing. Mm -hmm. There's inflation in stocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the yeah. things that there, there is inflation. Right. But – it's not in the things that they're measuring. They're looking at the goods, right? It, it's just like the. It, it's just like the, the. There's so much talk today about the wealth gap, and and look, we, we want a great society. We all do, but they're blaming the wrong people. The wealth gap. If you want to blame people, I mean, look at what the Fed has done. The Fed's caused this, haven't they? I mean, all the things that they thought would would would, would help, they said, okay, well, what we want to do is get us out of the rut that we're in. And by doing so, what we need to do is juice the stock market because what that will do is they will create a wealth effect. If your stock portfolio goes up, you'll spend more. And, yes, they're correct that that's what happens, except that who are the people that have stocks? The people that have stocks are those that can afford them, that are in a, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more of a wealthier class. And because of that, they have benefited to a greater extent. And, and this is, you know, so, so when we, we look back at it, you know, the Fed has all of these unintended consequences that occur from their actions. I mean, remember, you have 12 people, 12, there's 7 billion people in the world, <laughs> yeah. 12 of them, 12 of them who, by the way, have never so much as run a lemonade stand or had a newspaper out in their life, so <laughs> no real-world experience, solely academic, are making the decision on the most important price in the world, and that's the cost of money. Wow. The most important price in the world of 7 billion people is in the hands of 12 people who have no real-world experience. Sounds like a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're living it. Yeah. Um, so you wonder why we got booms and busts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're saying, obviously, what you're saying is making a lot of sense. I have a question though. So, what do you say? Because there's a population of people because of what happened in the not so recent past that people remember. I feel like a lot of people are kind of waiting on the sidelines with money, waiting for the recession so they can uh, invest it. I'm, I'm talking more more people on the streets than you would normally see. But like, oh no, dude, I'm I'm putting my money away because I know something's coming. So here's a couple of things that are occurring. So let's take it first at a, 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 a level that affects housing and, 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 and mortgages first, right? So right. There, are, there is talk from people saying, well, you know, the Fed's going to cut rates, so I'm not going to refinance now. Yeah, yeah well, a lot of people here, say that. Here's the thing. Don't make that mistake. Right now, there's 8.2 million people, according to Black Knight, who can benefit by a three-quarter percent drop in interest rates. That's a boatload of money. Take it and save that money because, listen, I mean, j just think about this for a second. 
if you can save three quarters of a percent, and let's just say it takes a year or a year and a half, right? Then refinance again. Yeah, just do it at no cost. I mean, that's the, that's the do trick. Do it at right? no cost. Yeah, right. or, or low cost. Low cost. Or low Little cost, to no cost. Not everybody right. could do. bring a payment right. because yes, what what whatever. Okay, we know we want to strategize it as good as we possibly can, but the point of it is is that you'd be giving up a all the money that you have made in a year, year and a half it takes of saving this, and then if you're right and rates go down a little bit, it would take probably three, five, six years to recover what you would have lost. So why not keep saving? And then if you did that refinance, like you're saying, guys, and you do it at that low or no cost, you didn't lose anything. Right. Mm -hmm. But here's the other side of it. I mean, look, I think rates are going to come down. What if I'm wrong? I'm certainly not going to be right 100% of the time. Take advantage. Of course, nobody is. Right. Here you've got a gift. Take it. Now, the people that are waiting to make investments – you know, that's pretty broad. So it's hard. Uh, it's hard to say because, you know, stocks, do they have some running room between now and, and before they reach a peak? I mean, clearly they do. A lot of people are calling for stocks to continue to go up. I mean, I think that the, the wise decision here of what, you're, what you want to do is just monitor it and be a bit defensive. You know, if you want to be in stocks, well, maybe you should have a portion of it in gold and treasuries, too, as a good hedge. Because, mm-hmm. You know, this way, if, if stocks don't do well initially, at least you'll be making it up in the other areas mm-hmm. because treasuries and gold will do well to kind of cushion the blow on stocks. You know, there's there's things that you could do, and you should speak to somebody who handles this. But, you know, if, if volatility becomes a, a factor, maybe you should have some money in the VIX as a hedge in case stocks don't do well. So there's a lot that you can do to be defensive. And all I'm saying is just be smart. And if you want to be on the sidelines, do what you're comfortable with. Being on the sidelines can be can be wise as well from time to time, but it also means that you might be missing an opportunity too. And and one other question I have, because Sal and I obviously we're in the industry, we do real estate every day. What would you say to people in mortgages in real estate? How should they be viewing what's coming down? Should they adjust anything? Is there anything that you, if you were in that seat, the way you'd be looking at your business going forward over the next two three years? Yeah. Uh, so just like we always said, make sure that uh, your transactional costs are lower. I'd rather have higher monthly payment and lower upfront costs because I think my, my financing will be um, will be at a lower cost in the right. future. So that it seems to me that that will be the first approach that I would take. Um, the other is that I feel pretty good about real estate right now. I'd also want to maybe, if I were a buyer, think that maybe I can. I can get a little bit of a deal because if sellers are fearful that there's a recession coming and they don't understand how it works and if they're listening to the media, but I might be able to get a better deal. I don't want to take advantage of anybody. But listen, if you're if you're a buyer and sellers are fearful, well, then, you know, as Warren Buffett says, be greedy when others are fearful, right? So, so that could be, uh, that could be a, a, a benefit to you if you're buying in the right, at the right time. Right, right. That's awesome. Um, so f- f- for you... Uh, Barry, um, I need to ask you one question. How good was that burger that you had this morning? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Because those things look, I mean, you guys were having breakfast burgers at 9 a.m. Yeah. I don't know who you're with, so but they all look happy. So it's not something we often do. But um, so I got a bunch of these, of these like, they're, they're like Peter Luger, and, and they've got onion and garlic burgers. So I had a whole bunch. I had some extra ones. So. You know, uh, I didn't want to refreeze them because it's never right. So right. I figured we'd make mm-hmm. them today. Now, I've got all kinds of plans today. So I called a few of the guys from the office. I said, boys, you know, you want to have, you know, burgers for breakfast and steaks <laughs> for breakfast? Like, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so 9 o'clock this morning, I had them all come over, and I'm cooking up burgers and steaks and crab cakes and all this great food. So uh, everybody was pretty darn happy. So I figured, what the hell is that crazy? I'll put it on Facebook. So uh, I guess you saw our, yeah, our live story Yeah, it there. was really good. It was really good. Um, I want to wrap this good up. Good way to start the week. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> um, we do, Next we, time you guys got to come, though. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, dude, well, I'll be there in a minute. Them, those burgers <laughs> look so good. You have no idea. I'll show you the video after. Um, real quick, Barry, we do, we do something at the, at the end of every show that's called three questions. Three totally random questions are kind of just for fun. So whatever pops in your head, you can answer it. Uh, the first one we always ask everybody is, "What scares Barry Habib?" And I think I'm. Well, um, you know, uh, it's hard because there's so much that you worry about, right? And 
um, I guess on a personal level, it's just, you know, you want to just, just, just make sure that nothing comes out of the blue that you're not prepared for. That's, uh, you know, just want to hope that everybody's healthy and safe. I mean, that's, that's always my, my, my biggest concern. People I care about just, uh, want to make sure they're all healthy and safe. So that, that for me is, is one personally, as far as, uh, uh, business wise, uh, I, I think that if, if, uh, if we are not, if we're not careful, just society wise, um, like I, I see so much infighting and you know class fighting and this and that. I just don't think that's a good thing. I just wish there were a lot less hate and a lot more communication and understanding. I mean, I don't think that people are as far apart as you might think um, if you just got to communicating instead of letting the media just kind of play it out and the extremes of each side just kind of you know out there just stirring the pot for personal gain. I just think we need to come together a little bit more. I just don't like the way things are, are progressing that way. I just wish we had a little more love and a little less fighting. Can't lose with more love, man. Um, so second question, if you could be one animal in the animal kingdom, who, what would it be and why? Well, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a hard one. I guess I guess I'm happy. I'm a human, you know, when it comes to all that. But you know, but um, you're like I'm, I'm good being a human, dude. <laughs> I guess I'd come back as a dog if I were the owner, because we're any animal lover, right? Because you know, if, if you have a great dog or a cat, and then you've got an animal lover that's that's uh, that's the owner of that pet. I mean, those pets get treated pretty Man. darn well. So, uh, so yeah, I think that'd be a pretty good life for sure. That I mean. If you could be, yeah, I would. I feel like you would take very good care of me if I was your dog. Oh my gosh! Well, I've got two dogs and three cats. My cats are all. I'm a big animal lover, so uh, I I love animals. All right. Last question is: If you could spend a week in somebody else's body, who would it be and why? Alive or or um, Uh, or uh, uh, you could do any. Yeah, that's a good. It's whatever comes to your head. You know, I, I I really wish I could get inside like some of the things that um, that are out there that we don't really know. So somebody high up in government, like a president, like you know, I've always admired Ronald Reagan. He's always been someone that, for me, uh, was just so he had this ability to inspire others, and he was. He, I just felt he was a great communicator and a great president, and obviously he knows all this stuff. So it'd be. It'd be, it'd be really cool to have that that knowledge and insight and inside information that a president would would have. So I'd love to be uh, someone like that if I if I could and just really like know all the real inside stuff. You know, mm-hmm. that's I mean, yeah. Could you would imagine? Be, yeah, I would. I'd be open to books and all like the nations yeah. world secrets. I need I need to go talk to people. Yeah, it would be awesome. <laughs> actually, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, Either that, or it'd be pretty cool to to be a rock star for a few weeks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, <laughs> two extremes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Just a week, right? Just one week. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we could take much longer no, than that. No. I don't think I could take much no. more than that. <laughs> yeah, one week could be. That's all I got. Yeah. Um, Barry, I I can't thank you enough for doing our show. I know you've done it a couple times now, and obviously, you've got a lot of things going on. You might be one of the hardest working people in the world, and also, not one person I've ever met has not said anything but amazing things about about you, and that speaks it volumes to you, to who you are as a person so we really appreciate it barry oh gosh that that makes me feel great well you and sal are doing some great things there and i always want to be supportive of you guys because you guys are just good people and you want to do good in the world and and that's what it's all about so um so thank you for all the good you do i appreciate it, man and, and good luck out there everybody that's listening thank you so much for listening we are out that's it we got that that was, a, that you, was our show see you barry thanks Bye. barry all right, guys. Yeah, we are out. We got. We, we are uh, ending the show now because it was a good show. Yeah, Man. informative. Lots I'm, of lots of info. I mean, but he broke it down so well. Well, I have a lot of clients asking me that same question right now, and it's funny because before the show, I'm like, yeah, you know. I mean, granted, it's Monday after a long you had a weekend. Night. You had a I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. if You're you want to wait, we can wait, You're right? But foggy. really, he's, like you said, right? Take the gift. Take the gift. Take the gift. Save the money. If we can do another gift. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's a good way to think about it. And, you know, often people always kick themselves for not taking the gift or or what was... Uh, should have, would have. Right? Yeah. Sh- oh, man, I should have done that, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's like, man, I wish I didn't do that. But at least with a mortgage, right? If you take the high rate up front or whatever, it's... Yeah, you, You'll be all you right. You can refi. Yeah. You know, rates come down again. 
Yeah, I think I think it, it just he broke it down so so well. So yeah. we're really lucky to have him on the show. Uh, for all of you listening, thank you so much for for listening to that. I mean, I I, I have to believe if you listen through that whole thing that you yeah. got something. Out it's of hard it. to. Uh, <laughs> You can't get, you can't talk. I mean, which is fine. Which is fine because it's just such good yeah. information just coming out of him. So yeah, I think that was the the least I've ever said. I think I said two words. That's for sure the least yeah. I've ever said. You know I like to talk. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. So um, thank you everyone that's listening that supported that supports the show. Go to irepodcast.com. dot com. You can find us anywhere else. Blah 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 blah. And we're out. We're out. That's it. You've been. Li-